Well, <laughs> thank you, Ben. Very, very kind indeed. And um, a heartfelt thank you to Stephen Shore and John and all those terrific team members working so diligently behind the scenes uh, to create this wonderful event of enlightenment. Um, thank you so much. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to tune in today. It's certainly an honor for me to be here. Uh, typically, I'd spend an hour or, or two uh, touching on all the relevant aspects of the connection between our, our food choice and the environment. But for this event, we decided to divide it into two parts, uh, two different but, but critically important presentations. Um, and I'd also recommend, highly recommend that we, if you could leave the view of my uh, slides, whatever slide we happen to be on, as the predominant view on your full screen, uh, we have uh, quite a bit of information sometimes packed onto some of those slides. So uh, without uh, further ado, let's, uh, let's begin, shall we? Everything looks great, doctor. You're all set. Okay. All right. The last couple of years have, have certainly been difficult, haven't they? Um, uh, some, can I move this screen over a little bit? I need to move uh, the right side of your screen over. Yeah, um, you can drag the, uh, the, the, the green box to the, uh, the rightmost side. We, we, see, we see your entire pre presentation, though, Dr. Oppenheimer. Oh, you could there? Yeah. Uh, how, do I, how do I shorten up what, what you have here? Just I need to drag everything over to it's in the way of my presentation. Oh, let's see. I need to get it down to the bottom somehow. Oh, there we go. We will be good there. Anyway, are you, you're good? Good to We're go? We're good. We're good here. Oh, okay. Okay, so the last couple of years have certainly been difficult, haven't they? Uh, more difficult for some than others. We had to traverse uh, hardships in, in many ways. Uh, businesses and families have suffered. We've lost loved ones. Some lost to an unexpected widespreading viral pathogen and others may have been lost to some other unfortunate reason, perhaps even to, even to an accident. So, so now I'm unable to move my slides, Ben. Um, Dr. Oppen, um, do you have, um, can, you, can you click on, on where you have the, uh, the presenter view? And then you can, you can cycle through the slides there. Um, yeah, what I need to do is move all the real truth about health. That whole section is, taught, is on the whole left, right side. And I need to kind of move it out of the way. Somehow minimize the whole thing. And also it's not advancing. My screen's not advancing. Somehow there's an interference between what you have on and my screen. If you want, uh, so stop sharing your screen and then and reshare it again. Yeah. Want to try that? Yeah. Okay, we good there? Yeah. But, okay, and we'll just start over again. You try to adjust what you have now and then, and then do the uh, screen share. Did, did, it, uh, did it work for you? No, I still can't advance my screen at all. Um, um, it won't advance. Uh, I have to click on each individual one down below, but that's not advancing. Uh, you, can, you can use your arrow keys or use the page of a page down key. Is that, is that that's not working? No. Um, it was working until, you know, we started uh, the slide, I mean, I just tested it this morning and it worked fine. If you want, actually, um, exit out of the PowerPoint and then reopen it again and then, 
So how, how are you advancing with this line? Are you advancing with the, the clicker or you're advancing? I'm clicking. Them? I'm just, it, I'm just manually clicking on each slide, but I don't think it's, it's not really advancing. I mean, it's not, it's not able to advance. Like I have slides in sequence and they're not advancing. Um, and, and what and how usually events with the arrow keys, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Or the space bar. Yeah. Um, so there we go. Maybe this will work, but I have to get you down a little bit. Okay. You want to try that? Sure. Still won't advance. Yeah. So after you, you, you click on, um, you try to click back on, on the, uh, the PowerPoint to have that selected and then you should advance with those, with the keys. Okay. Let's try this. Okay. We ready, ready to go. Let me see if I can advance it this way with the arrow keys. All right. Ready to go. All right. Let's kind of move forward if we can. Uh, some may have been lost to, to uh, relentless illness unrelated to COVID that was untreatable by any conventional or even unconventional methods known today. All quite sad, but we must go on. And of course our hearts and prayers need to continue going out to those in, in Ukraine where their lives have been changed forever. However, we might define it, the world as we knew it five or more years ago has changed considerably. If we sit back outside of the proverbial box uh, for just a moment, viewing all this, I think we will be able to see certain aspects of what has happened over the last few years that, we, that were harmful or even devastating globally and project what we might very well see over the next 50 years related to food choice and the effects of global depletion. The effects will be protracted. The damaging effects won't happen all at once. It'll be drawn out over over years, uh, causing significant chaos on many levels, loss of property and lives, and most certainly the vast majority of humans and other species on earth will be affected. We already are, although some much more severely than others, unless we act now and in the right manner. Well, my presentation today and next Tuesday should provide you with a better view of the landscape of what I mean by all this, and also provide you with a uh, quite easy and viable solutions and provide you with, with hope. Even though I could spend all week talking about any one of these topics, today we're going to be covering these specific areas of concern. Next Tuesday, we'll be covering these very important topics to round out this food choice sustainability connection and complete the, the picture for you. Knowing and doing. Well, this is Earth, the planet we live on. And of course, there's, there's only one Earth. Uh, it's been here for four and a half billion years with life thriving on it for three billion years. Hominids such as Australopithecus came into the picture at about four million years ago. And hominids uh, came in about four million years ago and our species Homo sapiens at the upper right came into the picture at about uh, 300,000 to 800,000 years ago. Put into perspective then our planet and life on it's been here for quite some time, four billion years before we were. Agriculture and civilization began about 6,000 to 10,000 years ago when we started domesticating animals and plants and began cutting down trees and forests. And then industrialization took place with factories popping up everywhere in the mid 1800s to, to early 1900s. So with this extraordinarily long history of life balancing itself so very well, in a natural manner for so very long on our planet, we humans came along and began the path toward creating serious damage to our planet, to ourselves, to other species in only the last 150 years. A snapshot of our planet today reveals this. We're running out of land and fresh water. Pollution and human-induced greenhouse gas emissions are threatening our atmosphere and waterways and negatively affecting our climate. Our oceans and sea life are being destroyed. We're losing habitat ecosystems and biodiversity with mass extinctions that are occurring at a rate that we haven't seen since the dinosaurs were lost 65 million years ago. Over 900 million people in the world are suffering from hunger. One half of our topsoil has been lost with areas becoming completely desertified. All this while we witness escalating rates of emerging and chronic disease regarding our own human health. 
There are some scientists who predict that time is running out for us as a thriving species. We may only have 50 to 100 years left before things become quite bleak. Now, these are researchers. They're not doomsdayers. I call all this global depletion, the loss of our primary resources on Earth, as well as our own health. It's still sustainability. I just think we need to hear it from a different direction, and we need to hear the whole story through an unfiltered lens. And for me, the story is constantly changing from one of originally needing to simply increase awareness to one now of stopping an aggressive cancer that's quickly consuming all of us. These are just some of the timelines we're going to be discussing this, this morning and, uh, and again on Tuesday. For instance, phosphorus and nitrogen balance is irreversibly altered today. Oceanic warming is predicted to continue with rising seas for centuries from now, even if we stop all greenhouse gas emissions from all fossil fuel use today. 240 million acres of tropical rainforest will be destroyed by the year 2030 and mostly replaced by livestock and crops to feed them. But we have six recognized categories of generations of humans living right now. The younger Z and alpha generations are over there at the right side of the slide. The millennials have who have the highest population are in the middle. And over the far left, we have the greatest generation. And we have a daunting task in front of us today uh, regarding this environment issue to, to first realize that we're damaging our planet and to what extent. That's, that's the first step. And then how to somehow fix it. But when I step back and look at this, I see a picture of tremendous responsibility, opportunity of profound historical magnitude. Although even children can certainly be leaders on behalf of our planet, it's really my generation and the generation of our adult children, those three or four generations in the middle here that are in the strongest leadership position today. Well, we're in a unique situation to save earth as we know it, save life on it now and allow a livable future for those who come after us. Or we could ignore things, act like nothing's happening or hey, when we get around to it sometime and allow it to continue on its current path to possibly be destroyed. Now, what's at stake here? the extinguishing of our own species and thousands of other species. We can essentially make or break humanity. That could be at stake. And if you think that this is an overstatement, an exaggeration, or that this problem is entirely related to climate change, well, then that doubt, that skepticism and lack of awareness and lack of action all become part of the problem. So certainly something needs to change. What is it that we're doing to our environment? What needs to change? And, and importantly, how fast does this change need to really take place? Well, the answers to those questions are pretty easy. We need to stop those practices and habits that we administer every single day on a collective basis globally that create an unnecessary and proportionally large resource footprint, beginning with the largest footprint of all. Food, what we eat, and our agricultural systems. It's a larger resource guzzler than anything else we do. It also happens to be the easiest to change. Well, okay, as compared to mandated global population control and the culling of other humans maybe to get us down to a 3 billion mark as we were in 1950, that's not gonna happen. And, and it's a weak argument to the continued destruction. We also will not see the immediate elimination of all fossil fuel use. That isn't gonna happen anytime soon. And, and you know what, even if it did, it really wouldn't address a number of aspects of global depletion, it simply, it simply won't. Well, how quickly do we need to change our habits? our footprint. I can tell you this is not a time for baby steps because it needs to be done right now. It needs to be done today. We're on very real timelines and it's much worse now than it was five years ago when I last made this call to action for everyone. Let's take a closer look at all this and, and see what it means. Many of the choices you make in life will have a profound impact on something else in the world, especially with things you consume like food. It's one of the major disconnects that we seem to live with. What you, what you do here might affect something over there and how to start looking outside the microcosm or the bubble that each of us tends to live in and then how to encourage others to do the same. Well, for those of you who still don't know uh, much about me, despite the, the wonderful introduction, just a little bit about my journey, I became very concerned about what sustainability really does mean and began looking at food choices and agricultural systems quite some time ago. So, so I stopped eating processed foods and I stopped eating animals and animal products while I was in graduate school nearly 50 years ago. Uh, yep, it was 50 years ago. And since then, uh, I've spent tens of thousands of hours researching farms, cultures, ideologies, and the effect we have on our planet by way of food production. 
I've been researching factory farms initially, as well as various grazing or grass fed systems, fish farms, cage free, large and small operations in the United States and in many countries overseas, learning and and always, always questioning. From this point forward, I'm spending most of my time trying to align governments, academic institutions, think tanks, funding organizations, all those that are in a position to move the critical mass forward in a positive manner. It's my goal to get, to get everyone on the same page regarding our environment and, and to do this very quickly. We're gonna examine that word sustainable again, pretty carefully today, because this word's constantly misused and it's morphed into so many different meanings to suit so many different needs. For most people, it still refers to our energy sector uh, or to, to waste, how, what and when to recycle or even to economic or, uh, or social sustainability. But rarely, if ever, is food choice properly connected to sustainability efforts, especially the raising and eating of animals. Despite the enormous effect, it's, it's still simply too challenging for everyone, culturally, socially. And yet this word sustainable is the most important word in our vocabulary that we need to define correctly because, well, if we get this word sustainable wrong, the consequences aren't so good, are they? <laughs> A little stark, but indeed civilizations have vanished based on how they used or misused their environment. And we're the next in line, but this time it's different because we're slowly taking down other species as well as ourselves as a global community. As I mentioned, we humans have reached a cr critical and fragile point in our evolutionary journeys as species. Just in the, in the past hundred years, a blink of an eye, really, we've reached the Anthropocene era where we've acquired the power to negatively change our biosphere and geosphere, the cryo, hydro, and atmosphere. We're ruining the very environs that sustain us and all other life on earth. Unfortunately, we haven't acquired the wisdom or the maturity to be able to manage this power in a sensible or beneficial manner. In fact, six out of nine identified tipping points or planetary boundaries related to our life support systems on Earth. Six out of nine have already been passed. And all nine boundaries are interconnected as one collapses, the others will soon follow. A few years ago, a team of 28 internationally renowned scientists identified and quantified uh, planetary boundaries within which humanity can continue to develop and thrive for generations to come. However, crossing these boundaries will generate abrupt and irreversible damage to the environment and create risks for continued human existence. But once again, six out of nine boundaries have, have now already been crossed. And with the other three boundaries, we're exceeding their tolerance levels. The boundaries that we've crossed are with loss of biosphere integrity and extinctions, We've already crossed that. Land system change, gone. Altered biogeochemical flows, such as with phosphorus and nitrogen. Climate change. Accumulation of novel entities, which are, which are microplastics, nanomaterials, and chemical pollution. And the sixth boundary crossed is ocean acidification. Now, now I think this can be a little too complicated for, for, for some people to quickly grasp. So I, I simply call all this global depletion, which is what I've, I've been calling it for the, for the past 20 years or more. The story for me still always begins with these two numbers. There, there's just a little under 8 billion people, 7.967 billion people living on our planet today with 200,000 added every single day. So control the growth of our population is an issue, but it's not nearly the problem as the number on the, on the right and a little lower that you see on the screen, what we're doing to the planet. The number on the right represents the fact that there are more than 80 billion animals living on our planet that we raise and eat for food each year, and it repeats itself year after year in growing numbers. And this is the problem. In fact, this 80 billion number is quite impossible to pin down. And it's very much on the light side because these figures uh, do not include up to 1.7 trillion chickens in the world or, or the 2 trillion fish in the world that were slaughtered during that same year. So let's look at a graphic about global depletion. Certainly there are other industries that contribute to this picture, but none have the comprehensive impact as animal agriculture. Simply put, we're in overshoot mode, demanding more of our planet's resources than what it can supply. We've been in overshoot mode since 1973. Globally, it would take now two full Earths to sustain what we're currently taking from and doing to our planet. Here in the United States, it would require over five Earths to support our current lifestyle. 
it's serious enough on its own merit, but it's made much more so because of the layers of various influences that vary the problem and its solutions. Now, what's critical for everyone to understand that this isn't just an industrial or factory farm issue. No, not at all. It's a, it's a raising animals to eat issue. And we're going to see that as we go along. Let's continue refining our thoughts on global warming uh, or climate change. First, we need to remember that global warming and climate change, well, that's just, that's just one component of the much larger, more insidious problem of global depletion, the more total effect we have on our planet. And again, it's not all caused by the energy sector. Well, discussions regarding global warming and climate change have now taken front stage nearly everywhere. It must be remembered, though, that the climate change will have the effects of exacerbation. It takes events and makes matters worse. So global warming and climate change, for instance, will not be the initial cause of these categories of global depletion. We, we cause these things. Climate change will worsen them. Well, these climate change reports were re released very recently. The uh, IPCC or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that you see on the screen uh, just came out 45 days ago or so, documenting the work of over 450 scientists. And the reports are gloomy at best, we're, that we're breaking a number of records, records we, we shouldn't be so proud of, finding that last year was the fifth warmest on record, despite being cooled part of the year by La Nina. And from 2013 through this year, well, they rank as the 10 warmest years on record. Global temperature has now reached a 1.2 degrees centigrade rise above pre-industrial times, a new record. Concentration of greenhouse gas emissions in our atmosphere reached 420 parts per million just yesterday, a new record. Oceans are now rising over four millimeters per year, a new record, having risen faster and become, becoming warmer and more acidic than ever in recorded history. In fact, the oceans are becoming more acidic at a faster rate than ever seen in the past 56 million years. Well, many of us, uh, certainly most of you attending this wonderful event, not everybody, but most of us understand that climate change is real. You understand and appreciate the implications of unabated global warming and that we humans play an important role in becoming resilient and adapting to it. But instead of just becoming resilient to climate change or adapting to it, I would suggest we all understand some simple unfiltered basics of what really causes climate change, how to most easily and effectively solve the problem and what realistic timelines that we're confronted with. And then I would suggest we try to reverse it. Well, the basics look like this. Our planet is warming in an accelerated fashion, which then causes our climate to change. The more it warms, the more drastic our climate and temperatures and weather patterns will be. Well, this global warming is due to excessive greenhouse gases that are produced on Earth. Some are from natural causes, such as volcanoes, wetlands, Arctic tundra, and our oceans. But our planet's always had a beautiful way of balancing those small amounts that have been produced historically by simply sequestering or drawing down those gases back into, into the land, into the, our land and oceans. Except whenever this has been drastically imbalanced millions of years ago, which caused mass extinctions. But significant greenhouse gas imbalance is happening again today. Until around 1750 to 1850, the time referred to as, as pre-industrial, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions produced naturally on Earth had always been around 17 to 29 gigatons per year. Since the 1850s though, we humans through our everyday actions and choices are now creating more than two times that much each year, around 39 to 64 gigatons per year. And our planet because of this has warmed again between 1.1 to 1.2 degrees centigrade since the, that pre-industrial time of 1850. So this excess greenhouse gas accumulation in our atmosphere is what's causing global warming. The three gases most associated with global warming are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. There are a few others involved as well. Since carbon dioxide is the most prevalent emitted gas at just under 75%, and is mostly caused by the burning of fossil fuels, gas, oil, coal, it has become the focal point, the center of attention of all efforts of those who know we need to address climate change, businesses, policymakers, or the media. So let's go after carbon dioxide. But that's not the gas that we should be entirely focused on. Today at nearly 2000 parts per billion, three times what it was in 1850, methane is responsible for 30% of the rise we've seen in global warming since those pre-industrial times. 
60% of all methane emissions are from human activities. And furthermore, livestock, animal agriculture is responsible for nearly one half of all human induced methane emissions globally, more than gas, more than oil, more than coal. Methane is 86 times more powerful than carbon dioxide as a global warming agent over a 20 year time frame. In fact, at the point of initial emission, methane is 120 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. And now carbon dioxide stays in our atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years, but methane breaks down shortly after eight to 10 years and then turns into carbon dioxide and water vapor, which are also uh, uh, greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And then it hangs out longer. And despite the pandemic during the year 2020, we witnessed the largest one year jump in methane emissions on record, even though we weren't traveling as much and burning fossil fuels, but we were consuming meat. So to stop further climate change, we, we need to drop human-induced greenhouse gases, not just carbon dioxide, but from all sources that we're emitting today. But drop it back down to what? All climate change organizations and experts today, they believe that we need to cut emissions to one half of what they were in 2020 by the year 2030, and to get to zero net emissions by the year 2050. But others, including me, believe that, that it's, it's too late for that approach. So the first step is to be clear on where most of these human produced greenhouse gases are coming from, what industries, what sectors are the largest emitters. Then there should be swift action to stop them from emitting. Then the second issue should be what happens to all that extra carbon dioxide that's still left in our atmosphere and likely will be there for the next hun few hundreds of years. But so let's first attack those large emitters of greenhouse gases, who, who are they? Well, these numbers try to answer that question when published started a bit of controversy. I mean, how could the meat everyone's eating cause more greenhouse gas emissions than what's caused by powering all the cars, trucks, planes, and trains that we drive and fly every day? I mean, how could that be? But instead of 18%, as that original 2006 United Nations report stated, or even their most recent figure of 14.5%, a couple of researchers found that livestock could produce, I mean, it's possible they could produce as much as 51% of all human-induced greenhouse gas emissions. Now, most scientific organizations are not on board with this figure yet, but, but there are a number of reasons for the differences between these two numbers, low to high. Most important for me is the vast under-reporting in, in that 2006 United Nations report at 14.5% or 18% even, the use of inaccurate global warming potential for methane, they used 21 instead of 86 or 120, and these reports also fail to factor in all the greenhouse gases emitted because of our demand to eat fish, the fuel refrigeration, processing, packaging, transportation, et cetera. And there's profound bias amongst the authors of those reports who are well-known consultants for the livestock industry. All have affiliations, partnerships with the meat, dairy, and egg industries. Of course, they're not gonna come up with the right numbers. It would indict the very industries that they're working for. And the bias continues today with recent articles such as this one that you see that attempts to def defend those lower greenhouse gas numbers for the livestock industry. It's so very true what they say at the top of this article. We need to get the numbers right from a public opinion standpoint as well as a policy making standpoint. But again, all these authors have very deep ties to the meat and dairy industries. Well, so these lower numbers of 18% and 14 0.5% also don't properly fact in land use optimization or what could be re referred to as carbon opportunity costs, how land might be used more carbon and methane efficiently. With these costs properly positioned into the equation, many could argue that animal agriculture is indeed responsible for minim minimally between 37 and 51%. In fact, my good colleague, Dr. Silas Rao has recently eloquently proposed that animal agriculture may be responsible for well, it may be responsible for 87% of all global human-induced greenhouse gas emissions, and therefore the leading cause of climate change. So if you're not familiar with Dr. Rao's work, I'd highly rec recommend listening to his presentation at this event, and also during the panel discussion, uh, where I'll join him and Glenn Merzer on Monday at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And regardless of where the exact number resides, somewhere between 14.5 or or 51 or perhaps likely 87% with all factors considered, it's cause for alarm and immediate action. 
A perfect example of how all this information is suppressed occurs every single year during the climate change conferences called the Conference of the Parties, held originally in Kyoto with its 1997 Kyoto Protocol. Last year, it was a 26 yearly conference held in Glasgow. This year, it'll be held in Morocco, where countries come together and they're trying to solve this global warming problem. But none of this that you see at the bottom of the screen is being addressed. Well, organizers at COP26 last year realized that the time is running out, established an agreement to reduce methane emissions by 30% of the year 2020 levels by the year 2030, and 105 countries signed on. So this was touted as a, as a highlight and a success. Well, this was essentially a failure because there's no legally binding contract, there's no metric, there's no penalties, the timeline doesn't correlate with the increasing severity of the problem, and the three largest emitters, Russia, China, and India, didn't even pledge. And in the future, there's gonna be much more greenhouse gases emitted from natural causes, such as methane from the thawing of permafrost and the tundra because of all the damage we have already done leading up to today, which is set off feedback looping mechanisms that accelerate global warming beyond and much faster than we, than we first calculated. Well, the focus once again today is on fossil fuel reduction with no regard to livestock, even though, again, animal agriculture is the largest emitter of human-induced methane in the world. Well, gas and oil is around 23%, coal is at 12%, but uh, animal agriculture is just under 50%. Taking this a step further, our government enacted this emissions reduction plan. This is a plan by, whereby $17 billion will be used to help meet the goal of reducing U.S. methane emissions. But, but all this is targeted at the oil and gas industry, all the funding, even a methane tax at $900 per ton emitted starting next year and going up to $1,500 a ton by 2025. What's well, fully targeting the gas and oil industry. I mean, do they need to be penalized? Yeah, of course, of course they do, but they're not the problem. The only thing mentioned in this entire action plan to reduce methane in the agricultural sector is, well, they're, they're gonna set up a, a research committee to further assess the situation. Nothing at all in terms of incentivizing penalties or taxation to the meat and dairy industries, no funding set aside, nothing. And you have to ask the question, why was some marketing catchphrase used uh, like 30% by the year 2030, rather than simply enacting what we should do and what the, what the planet needs? So here's what I propose based on what the planet desperately needs regarding methane. First, we have precise and complete accounting methods globally for the production of methane by the end of this year then mandated education about the reality of climate change, the dire timelines we're on, the factual impact of animal agriculture and solutions. And then we set bars for emissions of methane to be cut by 50% across all sectors by the year 2027 and to 0% by the year 2030. And we should, shouldn't accept anything less. And those industries and individual farmers and businesses that succeed in doing this could receive tax breaks. And those who, who do not will have strict penalties imposed, all this funded by the reallocation of government money that's already set aside for targeting gas and oil and by the revenue generated, of course, by collecting methane taxes on all those animal agriculture operations and, and businesses that are not complying. Well, every aspect of, of global depletion has a timeline. It's not really a question of if we're going to run out of something, it's when at our, our current pace. One of the most critical timelines of all is that of of climate change. Climate scientists believe that we've already passed our timeline because now it's a more of a matter of how to minimize the, the change in climate that we've set into motion and thereby minimize the future damage. And it does appear dire when we view just how much greenhouse gas we've, we've dumped into the atmosphere since 1850. Carbon dioxide levels have always been, they've always been hovering around 277 parts per million for the past 10,000 years. That's the that lower green line that you see across the slide, for 10,000 years, it's been in one, one spot. And then look what happened at the far right. Today, we're at 420 parts per million. So the first goal would be to drop our emissions so that we are not contributing further to this number. And then the second goal, again, would be to get rid of all that extra carbon dioxide that we've emitted since the 1800s. Otherwise, it just hangs around for hundreds of more years, causing more climate issues. Well, how do we do that? Well, we could use some geoengineering and, and spray some material into our atmosphere to block the sun's rays at, at various times, which is being proposed and obviously just cause more problems. 
Or perhaps we could use some high technology and build machines that could extract the excess carbon dioxide and bury it beneath the ground like this company is starting to do in Iceland. But one of these single units costs $15 million and would require nearly 100 million of these units worldwide to pull down the extra carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And it's predicted to take about 75 to 100 years to simply scale up to produce this, this, these many units. So relying on this type of te technological approach, well, it would cost us one quadrillion dollars. Yeah, one quadrillion dollars, whatever, whatever that's supposed to be, <laughs> take till the end of the century to be fully effective. And this won't address any other aspect of global depletion that we're going to discuss through today and on Tuesday. So I, I have another approach. But first, before we get to that approach, we first need to look at some simple and relevant figures. Now, if you do the math, it's conceivable that we could exceed our budget, what scientists believe is allowed for more atmospheric carbon. We could exceed the, bu exceed the budget by the year 2050 before we begin a quicker spiraling downward regarding climate change. We'd exceed that budget without the energy sector of fossil fuels even factored into the equation, simply due to raising livestock. So before I tell you about my plan though, we also need uh, a quick look at our planet and how land is being used. Well, 71% of our planet are, are oceans, 29% land. Of, of, of all of our land, 71% is considered habitable, the rest being desert and glaciers. So that's what we're gonna focus on. One half of this habitable land is used for agriculture, one half. 11% is considered unusable shrubland and 1% is taken up by freshwater lakes and streams. Of all the land on earth that's used for agriculture, which is a little over 5 billion hectares, which is about 20 million square miles, of all that land, almost 80% is used for animal agriculture, land for grazing livestock and crops to, to feed them. Only 20% is used to grow plants for us to eat. But 82% of all the food calories eaten worldwide comes from that 20%. And please also pay particular attention to the fact that only 1% of all habitable land on earth is being used for urban development. 1% that I just circled on the screen. Certainly we can't use urbanization or urban sprawl as an excuse anymore for us running out of land on earth. Again, the problem we have is not the number of people on earth, it's what we're eating. So now my, onto my solution to this one portion of climate, of uh, global depletion, which is climate change. Once again, out of all the land on earth that's used for agriculture, 80% is used for grazing livestock and crops to feed them. That's a little over 4 billion hectares, which is almost 10 billion acres. Well, many researchers now agree what I had first proposed over a decade ago, that we could grow enough food to feed the human population today and into the next 20 years on less than 1 billion hectares. Thus, we we can stop all animal agriculture, remove all livestock from all grazing lands and convert those 4 billion plus hectares back to forests by reforestation or natural regeneration. In short term, over the next five to seven years, this would meet and exceed every country's methane reduction pledge. And by 2050, with more than 4 billion hectares reforested, we would also be able to sequester or pull down all the excessive greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide from where we are today at 420 parts per, 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 per million, closer to the historical levels of 277 parts per million, where we were for the past 10,000 years and our earth was, was much healthier. Inspired by the 1977 Green Belt Movement, the World Wildlife Fund joined Bird Life International and Plant for the Planet in 2018 to begin the Plant a Trillion Trees program, which then became a, even a larger movement two years ago when the World Economic Forum created 1T, an initiative for businesses, governments, and civil society to support this effort. Many others, such as my, my, my friend Jane Goodall, have also joined in on this movement. It's a, it's a wonderful idea on some levels, not so good on some other levels. The goal is for us to plant 1 trillion trees by the year 2030, which seems good on its surface. Nowhere, though, in any of these mission statements is there any mention or emphasis on food choice eliminating meat and dairy from one's diet. And yet that's the primary reason we need to plant trees, isn't it? 
yeah, we've been eating the wrong food all these years and had to cut down forests because we're running out of land to support this bizarre animal breeding and killing diet. Planting one trillion trees initially then sounds good, but it's essentially meaningless if the world continues to eat animals and animal products and thereby continues to deforest or misuse our resources while we're out running around planting trees. So this movement also over focuses on planting a certain number of trees rather than placing the focus where it needs to be, I think, which again, is just stop eating meat, stop deforesting, and then properly restoring all grazed and deforested land back to their near original state. For instance, if we restored the 4 billion hectares that we talked about a few slides ago, used for grazing livestock with plant-based agroforestry or simply natural regeneration, after 10 to 20 years, there'd likely be one to 2,000 trees growing per hectare multiplied times those 4 billion hectares, which would equal about 8 trillion trees, not, not 1 trillion. Again, and this could potentially sequester or draw down greenhouse gases somewhere between 108 and 181 gigatons of carbon equivalent greenhouse gases per year. It's pretty astounding. And then there are mangroves. Well, what are those? <laughs> well, these are critical coastal ecosystems that buffer communities against extreme weather events. They're so very important. They slow down erosion. They foster so much wildlife and biodiversity. And next to peatlands, mangroves store more carbon than any other vegetation on earth. We have lost half of the world's mangroves in just the last 50 years, 32 million hectares. More than one half of this terrible loss is due to aquaculture and shrimp farming and mangroves can sequester or pull down up to four times more carbon dioxide from our atmosphere than tropical rainforests do. So let's stop eating fish and stop eating shrimp, at least shrimp and fish from aquaculture settings. We'll talk more about fish and shrimp from our oceans tomorrow, or excuse me, on Tuesday. And let's begin reforesting 32 million hectares of mangroves, which would then sequester another four gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent greenhouse gases per year. So how, how important is food choice in climate change? We're currently pumping in 64 gigatons of carbon equivalent greenhouse gases into our atmosphere each year. If we converted all global cropland that's currently growing crops to feed livestock and converted all pasture land with grazing livestock to plant-based agroforestry systems producing food for us to eat directly, we find ourselves at a net negative greenhouse gas scenario. Complete mitigation, all greenhouse gases currently being emitted by all sources today could be sequestered into the soil and the excess, the excess, the excess carbon dioxide that we've pumped in over the past 200 years could be pulled down. This would then bring back wildlife, bring back biodiversity, protect our soil, calm weather patterns. This is where optimism about climate change can be found. And this is without factoring in all the carbon sequestration from restoring desertified regions or our peatlands, mangroves, and other blue carbon projects in our oceans. As a result of climate change, rising seas are already causing island countries to disappear. Kiribati, yeah, and that's how you pronounce it, Kiribati consists of 33 islands, all of them no more than six feet above sea level, 117,000 inhabitants, Maldives, population of a half million people and 80% of the nation's islands are less than, live less than three feet above sea level, most of which will likely be underwater by the year 2050, setting up mass migrations and loss of islands that had existed for, for thousands of years. Micronesia, Fiji, Solomon Islands, and, and many more are just a few of the examples of what's being lost in our lifetime due to our actions and then our inactions. Now, why is this important? Well, because the devastating effects of climate change are disproportionate globally. Most of us in highly developed countries have never visited these places, likely don't know exactly where they're located or how to spell them. But uh, all of these 58 small island developing states are losing their countries to rising seas due to climate change. Together, all these island countries, though, combined, are only responsible for less than 0.5% of all the human induced global greenhouse gas emissions. This is a grave example of how the choices we make, particularly with food choice, right here in the United States, will have a profound impact on, on some other living beings somewhere else in the world. With every bite of an animal product, we are essentially taking a bite 
out of the life of these island countries and causing undue pain and suffering to those that live there. But again, we can change this. Oh, I see. Well, you need something closer to home. Rising seas are expected to devastate, if not wipe out, most of our coastal cities here in the United States by the end of this century. By 2050, just 27 years from now, 150 million people around the world will be displaced, losing their homes from rising seas and tides, setting up mass migrations inland. And that, by the way, that 150 million figure is, is very conservative. So to summarize the connection between food choice and climate change, we have this. Climate change is very real. It's worsening and the situation's urgent since we've already passed the timeline. Greenhouse gas emissions that we produce, anthropogenic, significantly affect climate change. Raising animals for us to eat is one of the largest, if not the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, it's the most important industry to eliminate. And lastly, any food movement away from factory farms, but including grass-fed or pastured animal systems will not solve the problem. In fact, it'll make it worse. More land use changes, more deforestation, a higher feed conversion ratio, and more production of methane. 40 to 70% more methane is produced per one grass-fed cow as compared to grain-fed. But the reality is we just can't seem to get the general public on track despite all the evidence. Now, this poll uh, just came out a few weeks ago showing the embarrassing fact that only 70% of Americans believe climate change is real or happening. And climate change is listed as only our 14th most important concern. Again, climate change is just uh, the first step. And then there's connecting that to food choice and then connecting that to animal agriculture. And then finally, it's the connection to all other aspects of sustainability that we'll be talking about. So we have to get through this first step, which, which seems pretty challenging, especially with statements like this from one of our policy leaders in the United States. Huh. Yeah, this guy sounds like he has a pretty clear scientific approach to this subject as well as other subjects. And, and just when you think that he might be the only one in a powerful position, with a large platform of influence with this bizarre view, then, then this guy comes along. <laughs> it's embarrassing. And then there's this guy. There's just so many. So we have a few major hurdles to get over, don't we? But, but unfortunately, this might be the largest hurdle of all. Yeah, no offense. Really no offense to those Republicans in the audience at all, but statements like this are not making things any easier for our environment. So, so I think it's time all Republicans start rallying around another much stronger leader who, who along with much better attributes, uh, has some real environmental savvy. Yeah, there you go. I'm of course talking about this guy. Uh, he's your new leader. Well, current studies show that on average, we waste 30% of all food produced in the world. So reducing this waste is certainly important in our battle uh, against climate change and loss of natural resources. However, we can reduce our food waste to zero and still be wasting massive amounts of resources and continuing on a path that further furthers irreversible climate change if the food we're eating has anything to do with animal agriculture. Given the predictions of nearly every climate scientist in the world, our business as usual approach to climate change hasn't worked and time uh, just keeps ticking toward more irreversible damage. We, we simply can't continue focusing only on gas and oil. Therefore, it's time for us to get outside the box, uh, take, take the right action and to do it now. So a final summarizing look at solutions or prescriptions, this is what we have. Continue reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, sure, by ad ad advancing renewable energy sources, great ideas, but it'll take a few decades to be fully implemented. And we don't have that much time. In fact, we don't have any time. So another solution to climate change is we could stop eating animals today, right now. It, it doesn't take any time. And then we could begin the reforestation, regeneration of all that abused land. And that's the, pres that's the prescription to mitigate, not adapt to, or be resilient to, but to mitigate climate change. 
Well, interspersed throughout our discussions are a few themes. One theme is how information about this particular subject has been suppressed, even mismanaged. So much so that objectives of many important meetings like that, those climate change conferences and other organizations, well, well, the objectives aren't being met. And that all begins with the words we use, I think. How, how clear are they? Are they conveying reality? Well, these are all food movements that you see that superficially seem to make sense. They make you feel as if you're going in the right direction because they're going away from factory farms. They're going away from, from processed foods. And that's, that's gotta be a good thing, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Do any of these words mean sustainable or healthy? Many would want you to think so. How about the word humane? Does, does humane equal humane? Or does it equal sustainable for all involved? And, and, and if it does, which it doesn't, who is it that tries to define that word humane for all of us? Incredibly, there is one person that the USDA and every humane certified organization in the world relies on for that definition of humane. Only one person. Now, I've covered this strange and unfortunate issue extensively in one of my books. Um, so then again, does humane even equal humane? And what does real food mean? I mean, I have issues with its precepts. Real food's a, still a very large food movement, especially on numerous college campuses today. And it's, it's defined by being local, fair, sustainable, and humane. All, all four of those things, that sounds terrific. But, but this is terribly misleading. For instance, let's see, um, this, this little Aloha bar that you see uh, here is not, is not real food because it's, it's not local, uh, unless you live in uh, Littleton, Colorado, where it's made. And, and worse, it's, it's processed. Uh, but it does have, have pumpkin seed and other types of organic plant proteins, some, even some organic monk fruit, really put together quite beautifully well. But remember, it's not real food. It doesn't fit their definition. And um, let's see what else. Oh, yeah, this organic grown banana doesn't fit their definition either because it's not local. It was grown in Colombia. So unless you live in Bogota, it's, it, it won't be real food. Whereas these other food items I'm about to show you, well, they're considered real food by this real food group movement. Yeah, over 19,000 chickens are killed every minute, every 60 seconds in our country, 19,000. I suppose that's pretty real. And if chicken, beef, pork, fish, or any other animal product is considered real food. What about these? Real food too? Sure, why not? They're, uh, they all come, they come along with it and, and these pathogens are all free. <laughs> so unlike the banana or the Aloha bar, these, these poor souls are considered real food because they're local. And the real food people think they're sustainable, healthy, and humane, but they're not. They're none of those things other than being perhaps local. Therefore, the real food movement's flawed because the definitions they're using are flawed, similar to every other food movement on this list. Just because something's local doesn't at all mean that it's healthy or sustainable or humane. It doesn't even mean that it should be eaten. The only thing local means is that it's not very far from here. Buying local, in fact, has little to do with sustainability other than from an economic standpoint. It's a solid idea to help nearby farmers. And that's important, but in fact, transportation is only responsible for 4%, just 4% just of all the fossil fuels used and greenhouse gases emitted in the entire food production process. It's much more relevant to view this by using a complete life cycle analysis. In 2019, the United Nations des designated the next 10 years as a decade of family farming, which is a good thing for the 500 million small family farmers in the world, most of which have limited opportunities for improving their livelihood, and yet they produce over 80% of the world's food. But in terms of our health and the health of our environment, we must remember that it is the type of food being produced that matters most, not the size of the farm or the miles traveled. So by all means, support your local farmer markets, any one of the 8,700 throughout the United States and support your local cooperatives. But it, but it has to be plant-based in order to make good sense for our planet. And here's a new animal agricultural movement that's gaining momentum called Climate Smart. It's a nice thought. 
But given the global warming predicament we're in, shouldn't we be growing and eating only plant-based foods, which would then make this food movement the climate smartest? Yeah, I mean, we all, we all wanna be smart, but who wouldn't wanna be the smartest? Well, the most recent food movement in the United States and Canada and in, in Europe that's gaining considerable traction is this one to simply eat less meat, or now it's being called uh, a plant forward diet, but it's the same, same thing, same goal of eating less meat. So let's see, the logic in this food movement is if you recognize you're doing something that's, that's wrong, hurtful, and frankly, unnecessary, hey, hey, let's just continue doing that wrong, hurtful, unnecessary thing a few less times each day. Yeah, that, that makes sense somewhere, doesn't it? And despite what the United Nations and other gold standard organizations are promoting, this sustainability issue will not be solved by advocating eating less meat because, because that approach is subjective, it's inconsistent with the magnitude and the urgency of the problem, and it perpetuates irresponsibility with every bite taken. Also, unfortunately, it mistakenly shifts the focus to seafood, which as we all know, is not really meat, right? <laughs> Again, it all begins with the words we use. Are they conveying reality? Well, this represents a food term that's constantly over-focused on and used improperly. It's, it's a protein, perhaps a rudimentary protein. It doesn't have all the secondary and tertiary characteristics, but nevertheless, it's still a protein. So when you're thinking about eating protein, if that's a priority of yours, then this is what you should be thinking about. As in, I need to get my protein today. Protein is still not the little buddy looking over my shoulder here. No, that's, that's again, that's still my research assistant. Seems pretty obvious. And, and what about this couples therapy session? I mean, they're still together, but they're having difficulties still because one of them is constantly being called protein <laughs> and it's, it's not her name and she makes it very clear that she doesn't like it one bit <laughs> she's complaining to everybody they're calling me protein and i want you to do something about it well i'm i'm trying Protein is also not the guy on the left here. And yet that's what people are calling protein, aren't they? The guy on the left with the overzealous smooch <laughs> and the excessive amount of saliva. I mean, he's a cow. He shouldn't be called protein. He shouldn't be called protein any more than the guy on the right. And yet we do. In fact, his name is Plato. One of the most pressing concerns we have today regarding sustaining our life and future life on earth is our supply of fresh water. From 1941 to 2011, the world's population tripled, but fresh water consumption quadrupled. In 2016, the World Economic Forum ranked freshwater crisis as the top global risk to industry and society over the next dec decade, which we're still in. Not climate change, which was number two on their list, but freshwater crisis, lack of availability. Failure to properly, properly address climate change has now moved up to the number one concern of this forum this year, but that's not because freshwater crisis has improved. In fact, it's gotten worse. There's a growing gap between worldwide demand for water and what's really available. With so much demand, there's expected to be a 40% shortage in water supply in just the next eight years. What you decide to eat has every single thing to do with this. Scientists are very concerned about water scarcity, but, but I think it's really more a matter of water management, isn't it? Yeah, sure it is. Instead of focusing on technologies, we should be first looking at choices. Is, is this a good choice? How about, how about this choice? Is, is that a good choice? Are any of these good choices? They're all global averages on the conservative side. Are these good choices as compared to say these choices? It's quite a difference when you say, hey, it requires 400 gallons of water just to slaughter one cow or one pig 
in the United States, 400 gallons. Although water on earth remains constant, the consumptive form it happens to be in does not. Four out of five people now live within 30 miles of a water damaged area, meaning sewed or run out or polluted. More than 4 billion people experience severe water scarcity at least one month per year. There are nearly 300 transboundary river and waterways on earth where multiple countries share vital running water supply. As we see water shortages over the next eight years, we'll surely see droughts, famine, human sickness, and then we'll see conflicts social unrest and even wars. Indeed, those living downstream will be fiercely battling those living upstream for their water rights. Climate change is making these matters worse, but not causing them. Food choice and virtual water trading through food, especially with animal products, plays a much larger role than energy and fossil fuel use. In many areas of the world, freshwater scarcity coexists with hunger and poverty. Afghanistan, Sudan, and Saudi Arabia are raising livestock and crops to feed them while running their water supplies dry. 60% of Ethiopia's population suffers from hunger and thirst, and yet their dehydrated land is being used to support a growing herd of over 65 million cattle, the largest in Africa. Despite having an organization that's accomplished so many wonderful things in the world, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, and their foundation should be frankly embarrassed about funding the proliferation of animal agriculture anywhere in the world, let alone here in dehydrated Ethiopia. And so it is for Mongolia, India, China, Portugal, and nearly every country in the world struggling with an increasing human population, the effects of climate change and dwindling resources and, and being strangled by their meat and dairy culture. So this has to include the country of California, <laughs> doesn't it? And mo most of our Southwest United States. In the past 22 years, this mega drought in the Southwest United States has become so severe that it's now the driest two decades in that region in at least the last 1,200 years. So shouldn't we be using our water more efficiently? Regarding this freshwater topic, things aren't going so well in California, but if they given thought to where most of the dwindling water supply is going, it's not to golf courses, and most of it's not to lawn care. Between 60 and 70% of the total consumptive water usage in California goes to livestock and crops to feed them. You know, being concerned and mandating restrictions that include not watering lawns for two days after it rains or, or not using drinking water to, to clean sidewalks or to wash cars and, and with $500 per day in fines for not complying, well, that won't solve California's problem. Governor Newsom mandated a 15% cut in water use this past year, but that won't solve much either because California hasn't factored in the water footprint of what they're eating. As an example, California uses 960,000 acres of land just to produce alfalfa. Any, anybody out there from California? <laughs> why, why do you do that? <laughs> because each one of those 960,000 acres of alfalfa requires 2 million gallons of water per year to irrigate. And they all get irrigated, every one of those acres. And guess where all that alfalfa goes? It goes to livestock. 5% to horses, the rest to livestock, 75% to dairy cows. And there are 2.5 million dairy cows just in California alone. This brings us to the point of virtual water footprint, which is going to be much more relevant in the future as freshwater supplies globally shrink. Our virtual water footprint in this in instance is where we're extracting massive amounts of water from ancient aquifers to produce alfalfa or other feed crops that's then being exported to other countries. California alone is exporting 100 billion gallons of freshwater per year to China via hay to help feed China's 98 million cattle. Well, China's quickly closing in on Japan and United Arab Emirates as the, as the leading importers of our hay and our, therefore our fresh water. These countries are running out of land and they're also running out of water. They know it's not wise to use their precious drinking water to produce hay for cattle. So they might as well get it from the United States because we don't have that figured out yet. 
in all, the United States exports to other countries more than 80 trillion gallons of virtual water per year, which is two times more than what's being exported to by any other country in the world. And the vast majority of that water is tied up in livestock or in feed crops that are then shipped to livestock overseas. You know, using less water to brush our teeth or flush toilets or to do laundry or less time in the shower will save approximately two gallons of water per day for each act. Well, well, that's important. However, eliminating meat and dairy from one's diet will save on average over 2,600 gallons of water per person every day. If California stopped growing alfalfa for livestock just for one year, just stop for one year, the amount of water saved that one year would be enough to provide drinking water to the entire human population of the city of San Francisco. Yeah, not, not for one year, but every year for the next 12,500 years. Yeah, so you say, well, that's, that's hard to believe. Well, okay, but math doesn't lie. So there it is, I put it up on the screen for you, nor does where all the water is going in California, it doesn't lie. Further, the average household in the United States uses 76,000 gallons of water in one year, according to the EPA, indoor use, about 33,000 outdoors. That's quite a lot of water, and it's what we're focused on in times of drought, how to reduce this. Well, the average person in, our, in the United States, though, consumes 274 pounds of meat in one year. Yeah, divided between 85 pounds of cow and 66 pounds of pig and 123 pounds of chicken and turkey, in addition to the 288 eggs and 655 pounds of dairy products, which equates to 956,000 gallons of water per person per year just to support that animal product diet. So now a more accurate view that the, that the EPA should be broadcasting to everybody is that every household of three people in the United States, well, they use nearly 3 million gallons of water each year, not, not 76,000. The real amount is nearly 3 million gallons. And 96% of that outrageous water use is from their choice to eat animals. So whenever there's a drought or a water shortage anywhere in the United States, which there is, and there will continue to be, does the government or your community ever step up and declare a state of rationing or eliminating entirely meat and dairy? Why not? Why, why shouldn't they? In 2015, the largest desalination plant in North America opened near San Diego. It cost $1 billion and provides drinking water to about 10% of the human population in that area. Well, there's a two to one ratio of seawater coming in and drinking water going out that's, that's needed in the process. And the energy required to produce that water in this manner each day is enough to support the needs of 30,000 homes. Well, this approach to freshwater scarcity is very similar to those that I've seen in Israel, Saudi Arabia, Dubai, and other arid coastal countries around the world, now totaling more than 21,000 desalination plants. But the answer to our running out of a natural resource such as water, I don't think should begin by turning to another source of water and then causing other environmental issues and tapping that out as well. It seems the right way or the right approach to our, for our natural resources is to use them in the most efficient manner possible. So instead of desalination, it seems San Diego should have considered spending $1 billion on educating their citizens on the environmental benefits of eliminating meat, dairy, and fish from their diets, among other benefits. And then they would have liberated between 50 and 90% more water each day, rather than their meager 10% gain by way of sucking water from our oceans. And this is no different than the plan to pipe water from Lake Michigan in, in the, in the early 18, or excuse me, in the early 1980s to Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Texas, where it was discovered that the Ogallala Aquifer was drying up from irrigating all the livestock and crops to feed them in the Corn Belt in the United States. Well, we're running out of water in the Corn Belt to feed livestock, so let's build, let's just build a pipeline up to Michigan and draw water out of the Great Lakes. They won't miss it. And never once, you know, considering to simply stop raising and eating animals. Water problem solved completely, among other things, without a pipe. Well, recent satellite studies called GRACE, the acronym for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, has shown that 40% of the largest aquifers on Earth, 40% of the, 
are being overdrawn unsustainably and are becoming rapidly and irreversibly depleted. California's Central Valley Aquifer System is one of these, and, and also the southern portion of the Ovalala that we just talked about in the High Plains states. Well, they're two of the most at-risk ancient aquifers in the world of being entirely depleted in the next few decades. Others in significant trouble can be found in India, uh, the northern plains of China, uh, two of them in the Middle East. While some of the problem can be blamed on rice and wheat and irrigation, most of the ancient water used in these regions is going to livestock or crops to feed them. As an example, just one example, among other locations in the world, 6,000 water wells have dried up in California over the past seven years. Well, over 50% of those dried up wells happen to be in just one county, just one county, Tulare County. These wells didn't dry up because of climate change. No, they didn't dry up because of climate change. Tulare happens to be the leading county in the United States for dairy production. That, that's where all the water went to produce cow's milk at a ratio of about 1,000 gallons of water to produce just one gallon of milk. And for a clarified visual, here's a map of the wells drying up in the state of California. And I've circled Tulare County. Notice where all the dried up wells are located. And now here are the hot businesses in that county. Just for another bit of relevance. Notice anything related to to wasted water usage there. Let me see, um, they have stockyards and more stockyards and numerous cattle companies and more cattle companies and some livestock markets. Yeah, it might have something to do with it. You know, I've talked about this water use disconnect uh, 10 years ago and before to policymakers and think tanks and the public in California and elsewhere, but it's just no, no one seems to be listening. It's a bit frustrating. Of course, the threat is getting worse and it's spreading. Again, knowing and doing. Well water levels in the Southern High Plains states, such as Texas and Oklahoma, dropped by more than 150 feet within the last few years. Nevertheless, that area is still trying to support some of the heaviest concentrations of beef cattle in the world. In terms of raw numbers, livestock consume 34 trillion gallons of fresh water each year in the United States alone, 34 trillion gallons by way of drinking water and water to grow crops to feed them. A number of scientists have questioned and vetted uh, some of my numbers over the years, like, like this one. I'm quite used to it though. The, these type of numbers are buried, uh, oftentimes with other data, many times they have to be teased out of other research, extrapolated, and then, and then verified. It's a bit tedious and the results are incriminating for those industries involved. Let's face it, information like this that you see on the screen puts the meat and dairy industries on trial. Uh, what researcher wants to do that? Well, I don't mind, I don't have any problem doing it. So, so typically I provide any arguing scientists with all my data and computations like these that you see here. And then I say to them, there you go, uh, do the calculations yourself, have at it, have at it. And after they do, my hope is that they my, my hope is always that they stop eating animals too, and then they spread the word because they've all found out over the years that my numbers such as these are actually on the conservative side. So the question remains, even though we experience periods of, of less precipitation, is it, is it drought that we should be most concerned about in California and across the Southwest United States in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world? Or is it more of a problem of misuse of the freshwater supplies and resources that are available at any particular point in time. How we use them, how we manage it. Maybe this is the way we should begin viewing this, this issue of freshwater scarcity. So then these are the timelines for freshwater. It's not anything we should feel comfortable with. The NRDC predicts that one third of all counties in the United States, that's over 1100 counties spanning 14 states, will face water shortages by the year 2050. While palm oil has front page notoriety, tropical rainforest loss due to livestock has occurred at a, at a four times greater rate than that due to, to palm oil. In the last 25 years, 10 times more rainforest has been lost due to raising livestock than what's been lost due to palm oil. So be concerned about palm oil, yes, but then be 10 times more concerned about livestock and animal agriculture. Tropical rainforests cover 5 million square miles housing more than half of the world's 10 million species of plants, animals, and insects, and many more millions that are, haven't been discovered yet. 
The Amazon rainforest alone produces more than 20% of the world's supply of oxygen. Sure, Indonesia is losing rainforest to palm oil plantations, and that's not good, but all the rest of the countries you see on this slide are losing most of their forest due to livestock. The satellite analysis show that 30 million acres of tropical rainforest were destroyed last year alone, 30 million acres. Now, 36% of Earth's tropical rainforests have already been cleared, and 34% have been degraded. January of this year, 2022, saw the most amount of Amazon tropical rainforest deforestation on record, 166 square miles just in one month. Now, this is happening because of two primary reasons. First, it's, be, it's because of their president, Bolsonaro, who was elected in 2019, has drastically weakened environmental restrictions that were in place. And second, and most important, is the continued global demand for meat. JBS and Cargill have also become heavily involved in Ill illegal deforestation to further their profits. Unfortunately, for those living in, in our rainforest, this is what a few thousand to a million year old rainforest tropical rainforest now looks like because the world's food priorities are with eating livestock, not with being stewards of other living beings as we should be. But deforestation isn't the only statistic to be aware of. Much more damaging in many ways is degradation, which is harder to measure and it's not fully accounted for. The meat and dairy industries in the United Nations typically defined a deforested area of tropical rainforest as not having, as, excuse me, as having not less than 10% of the forest cover or canopy destroyed, regardless of how much forest has been wiped out underneath the canopy. <laughs> so degradation happens when roads are cut deep into rainforests and areas are thinned, uh, causing fragmentation of habitat and greater loss of species. So with deforestation, this is the sad result, the burning and bulldozing of rainforest. Soon grass, pasture, and cattle will follow this in, usually erosion, desertification, and localized climate change as well. If you if you choose to eat livestock here in the United States or anywhere else in the world, you're supporting this destruction by fueling the global demand for meat. There are three distinct opportunities that tropical rainforests have that could help mitigate climate change. First, we could eliminate deforestation and degradation as we talked about. Second, we could allow degraded forests to recover naturally. And third, we could reforest areas that have already been cleared. These efforts could sequester greenhouse gases at a rate of minimally 30 gigatons per year. That's just, that's just managing tropical rainforest. It's an amazingly simple approach to, to climate change that, that also fosters biodiversity and prevents further extinctions. Studies are showing that, it, that some areas of tropical rainforest are able to partially regenerate within just 20 years if simply left alone. Between 70 and 80% of all rainforest loss in the Amazon is due to raising cattle with another 10% loss due to growing crops to feed them and other livestock. And remember, these livestock are grazing, most of them. It's not a matter of factory farming and regardless of the effects of climate change. A quick word about soy. You know, 90% of the soy grown in the world is fed to livestock. Only 7% is used for direct human consumption. The United States and Brazil are the leading producers of soy since 2006, a soy moratorium had been in effect in the Amazon area, especially in the Cerrado region, the most biodiverse, richest savanna in the world, where deforestation of tropical rainforests had decreased substantially after 2006, just for a few years, for about five years after that moratorium was enacted. Well, the land soy occupies in the Amazon has risen, though, by 260% since 2006 to last year or this year, but most United States and Brazil governmental sources report that only 1% of all soy is being grown on newly deforested rainforest. So that seems to be a success story, right? Well, no, it's not because behind the scenes, <laughs> this is what's happening. Deforestation has risen since 2012 in this Cerrado area, especially in the state of Mato Grosso, despite the moratorium. And to get around the moratorium, farmers and large, large agribusinesses such as Cargill are still cutting down rainforests and then planting corn for a year on that newly deforested land. And then they turn around and plant soy for the next year and every year thereafter, because Brazil's moratorium to stop deforestation is as it applies to soy, not, not corn. <laughs> so this year, Brazil's predicted to have a record soy harvest, uh, all grown on land where tropical rainforest once stood. 
by the year 2050 made less resilient, but not caused by climate change. Most tropical rainforests will be gone, and the few patches that remain will have already been way past their tipping point. They're getting close now. This, of course, means that all the millions of species that originally lived in these rainforests will be gone. The indigenous tribes and shaman will be lost forever. The once abundant water systems destroyed, and of course their oxygenation and climate regulatory mechanisms will be lost. All lost for the next few thousands to millions of years, uh, which is how long it took these rainforests to develop to their current state of evolution. And we, we've wiped them out in less than 50 years. Some scientists and UN policymakers predict that we have only 60 years left before we run out of topsoil because one third to one half of all Earth's topsoil has already been lost just in the last 150 years. Now, most of the world's agricultural land suffers from severe erosion. Uh, we need topsoil though to uh, grow food. At the beginning of this erosion desertification equation is deforestation. And the majority of deforestation can be blamed squarely on animal agriculture. In fact, less than 2% of all crops grown worldwide are with organic methods for direct human consumption. Soil is the earth's fragile skin that supports all life on earth. W within soil, you'll find countless species that create a complex ecosystem. Animal agriculture is the single largest contributor to soil damage and loss by way of converting forests and grasslands to farm fields and pastures. In addition to erosion, though, soil quality is affected by other aspects of animal agriculture, including many negative aspects uh, by way of grazing. These impacts, regardless, regardless of what you've heard, these impacts include compaction, loss of soil structure, nutrient degradation, and soil salinity. You know, just one small teaspoon of soil will contain more living organisms than we have people in the world. Soil is at the center of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals because food security, water security, or water scarcity, biodiversity loss, and human health threats are closely linked to or dependent upon soil biodiversity. The International Union of Soil Science declared the years from 2015 to 2024 as the International Decade of Soils, which is a great effort to, to save one of our most precious resources, it's, although it's not working. This is their informational poster, which cleverly displays at the bottom within the roots of the plant what they consider to be solutions for the soil degradation crisis. The solutions such as, let me, let me see if I can read a few of these, solutions such as only bury the trash that cannot be recycled, okay? and walk different places so that soil is not compact. Yeah, good thoughts, but interesting and not surprising that I don't see here anywhere on their poster or anywhere else in their documents or website that there's not one mention about the number one cause of soil erosion and degradation, which is animal agriculture. So why wouldn't their number one solution in the roots on that poster be to stop eating animals? So I know someone out there will ask, I can't hear you in the audience from where I'm at, but I know you'll ask, well, why don't we just grow more topsoil, you know, um, in large test tubes or expensive reactors, similar to how we're gonna grow more meat in the future that we'll talk about on Tuesday, right? Or, hey, maybe we could, maybe we could make more soil with a new app on my smartphone. Yeah, we have technology to do that, don't we? Uh, well, we do have a way to grow more soil. It's called nature. and but in most scenarios, it requires up to 500 years just to grow one inch of topsoil. We're gonna to talk a little bit more about this again in my presentation on Tuesday and a quicker way to grow topsoil in terms of restoring desertified areas. Well, this is how much land is being used to raise livestock. 40% uh, of the entire ice-free terrestrial landmass on earth. If we factor in the 230 million acres of public lands used for grazing, livestock account for 90% of all land use for agriculture in the United States. Quite astounding. The reason animal agriculture creates so many sustainability problems is quite simple. It's terribly inefficient and it wastes resources, energy, and lives. 
you can produce 15 times more protein if that's what you're concerned about from plants as you can from animals on any given area of land. Meat and dairy products require up to 100 times more water than plant-based foods, a fraction of the fossil fuel use, and plants, of course, sequester or draw down, as we've talked about, greenhouse gases rather than causing them. Let's look at a, a, just one quick example of how inefficiently we're using our agricultural land here in the United States. We're using 94 million acres for corn. 46% of that corn is fed directly uh, to livestock, but that number is deceiving in a way because 43% is used for, for ethanol as fuel. So actually 82% of all the corn raised in, in our country that's, that's not used for fuel is fed to livestock. 88 million acres are used for soybeans of which 97% is fed to livestock. 52 million acres are planted in hay, which of course near, near 100% is fed to livestock. And if that weren't enough, another 864 million acres are used for grazing livestock on both public and private lands here in the United States. Now, just for comparison's sake, I picked out one of many, many examples of some other way to use all this land. In addition to reforesting or rewilding, uh, maybe we could just grow vegetables or fruit or some ancient grains for us to eat directly, such as amaranth, quinoa, kamut. So I, I picked out buckwheat as an example, and we're currently growing buckwheat on 27,000 acres in the United States. Sounds great. Well, buckwheat is considered somewhat of an ancient grain, but it's actually a, a, a fruit seed, not a grain. And, and from a human health standpoint, buckwheat offers you complete protein containing all eight essential amino acids, and it's got a very high utilization rate, meaning your body uh, uses 74% of the protein of buckwheat. Buckwheat is uh, low in fat, gluten-free, if you're concerned about that, packed with fiber, so it helps with insulin regulation, so it reduces the risk of diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. It has a number of antioxidants, anti-cancer items, and buckwheat has the highest levels of a substance called rutin of any food. Rutin is a very powerful anti-inflammatory agent. As a crop, growing buckwheat requires minimal water, grows in just about any type of soil, suppresses weeds, and adds nutrients to the soil. And yet, out of all the land used in the United States, used to produce food, only this much that you see on the screen here is devoted to planting and growing buckwheat. Oh, I did it again. I, it's pretty tiny, isn't it? Um, you probably can't even see that number. So let me blow that up for you a little bit. There, how's that, that better? Yeah, only 0.003% of all agricultural land in the United States is used to produce buckwheat and much of the end product is still handed over to livestock. Given all the amazing human health benefits of, of buckwheat and all the soil rebuilding characteristics of this plant, what percent do you think this should be? And remember, this is just one of the many examples of how we could be using our soil and water more efficiently while producing healthier foods for us to eat directly. Getting back to the human health benefits, many studies have been accomplished or are underway now that are documenting the, documenting the enormous amount of phytonutrients found only in plants and all the disease prevention and, and treatment characteristics of these compounds. So here's just a few of the many studies related to rutin, which is only one of many phytonutrients found in buckwheat. And this is just one compound found in just one plant. There are just so many more examples that we know of and yet to be discovered that I'm sure many other presenters will be talking about in this event. Well, this statistic needed to be updated. So I did, I updated it. Livestock now produce 11 million pounds of urine and feces every 60 seconds. 11 million pounds every 60 seconds, which is a hundred times more than the entire human population produces. 950 million people are suffering from hunger worldwide with a child dying from hunger every 10 seconds. To be sure, world hunger has many layers of, of complexity. One of the larger reasons is tied to poverty, but another significant factor is the looming shadow of our, our current demand to eat livestock and fish, which indirectly is tied to poverty. In fact, eating these animals ultimately affects food prices, food availability and policymaking, which then suppresses progress in developing countries. Last year, there was another, uh, considered another record harvest grain in the world with over 3 billion tons produced. But nearly half of that, just under half of that was given to animals in the meat and dairy industries. Each year, 77 
percent of all coarse grain produced in the world for food is consumed by livestock. That's maize, oats, sorghum, rye, millet, barley. So we can't blame climate change, droughts or flooding for the world's food security issues. Although they will be modifying factors, clearly the difficulty is not how or if we can produce enough food to feed the hungry or the growing global population, but rather where all the food we currently produce globally is going. Not too long ago, I was asked to speak to microfinance leaders uh, of many countries in the world at their annual conference in Istanbul. Among many other things, I explained that the, I explained the correlation that the correlation between uh, animal-based food production systems and world hunger can be found in generalized global factors as well as on a local basis within countries where hunger and poverty rates are high. Global factors include manipulation and control of seed manufacturing and pricing, primarily for livestock feed crops by large companies such as Monsanto and DuPont, buying and selling of grain, including futures by ADM and cargo, and through slaughterhouses and packaging by Cargill, Swift, Tyson and JBS. These few but very large and powerful companies control over 65% of all seed and grain and over 80% of all final animal products in the world. It's a very monopolized production and economic system, manufacturing seeds at one end and spewing out meat at the other. But because of, of the global demand for meat, cultural, social, political, and economic influences remain strongly supportive of these of the continued dominance of these large companies and of the meat, dairy, and fishing industries in general. This then drives how global resources are used, how money is spent, and how policies are determined. The demand for animal products, whether factory farmed or not, in developed countries drives resource depletion in developing countries, as well as perpetuating poverty and hunger. That is the correlation. So it's time we stop all this by supporting with our dollars only organically grown plant-based foods and those smallholder farmers that produce them. Solving world hunger is not as simple as giving them the grain that would normally go to livestock. It's not that easy. The solution, particularly in developing countries that I've written about over the years, requires a multi-dimensional approach to sustainability, establishing on many levels simultaneously with organic plant-based systems, food systems at the nucleus. The model for success at reducing hunger in developing countries, I believe, should look like this. No livestock. No fish. Th this is the model where all world hunger funding should be spent if it's to be considered responsible financing. Well, we're losing other species on Earth at an unprecedented rate. Uh, plants, animals, insects. The, the current view of most scientists is more related to the rate of extinction rather than the exact number because they simply can't keep up with all the extinctions that we're losing anywhere between 1,000 to 10,000 times the background rate, that which has been for the previous 10 million years, which used to be around two to four species going extinct per year. Now, regardless of the metric, it's now a massive and embarrassing amount. So, so why all the extinctions and what are we doing about it? Recognizing there's a serious problem and as part of the Convention on Biological Diversity held in 2010, 200 nations adopted a 10-year plan to save other species by the year 2020. Well, these are just four of those 20 targets that were agreed upon. Unfortunately, none of their primary targets were met, none. And worse, loss of biodiversity is actually accelerating. And by the way, uh, these are the recognized five drivers of biodiversity loss that you see on the, on the lower right side of the screen. You see a possible common denominator? Well, nearly all researchers agree today that climate change is not the first, and it's not even the second most significant driver of biodiversity loss. And they all agree that the leading cause of all five of these drivers combined is animal agriculture, livestock on land, and fishing in our oceans. So very similar to climate change, our leaders can set goals and targets all they want, but these goals and targets will never be reached without eliminating animals from our diet. For instance, it's pretty easy to meet their goal of uh, reducing overfishing. Yeah, just, just stop eating fish. <laughs> Done. Problem solved. I also know where they could get 40% more land to save. With failure of their targets set in 2010 at their meeting in Nagoya, and again 
in 2020 in Aichi, last year, the Convention on Biological Diversity announced a new set of goals. Here we go. Once again, there's no direct mention of a plan to eliminate the major driver of biodiversity loss through all influencing factors, which again is the meat, dairy, and fishing industries. Their 21 targets will very predictably not be met. Once again, climate change plays the role of being an exacerbator, but not causing this. It's just going to worsen another category of global depletion. The Living Planet Index shows that we lost more than half of all vertebrate animal species in the world since 1970. Half are gone. It's no surprise that during that same 50-year period of time, global production of meat and dairy products quadrupled. While well, a landmark study was published in 2019, the most comprehensive ever regarding the state of our ecosystems, and among other things, they predicted that 1 million plant and animal species are predicted to be at risk of extinction just within the next few decades. One million. Essentially 30 to 50% of all living species on earth will be extinct or heading toward extinction by the year 2050. Here's a view of more than 40,000 species that are on the verge of extinction today. Today, with only a few hundred remaining on earth, the mountain gorilla is number three on their list of most critically endangered for this year. Oh, well, what we're doing to other forms of life on earth is unparalleled in the history of our planet where, where one species is causing the mass extinction of nearly all other species. It reminds me of this somewhat well-known and very appropriate comment that if all insects on earth disappeared, within 50 years, all life on earth would end. However, if all human beings disappeared from earth, within 50 years, all forms of life would flourish. Even Pope Francis weighed in on his concern that earth is our home, the environment has rights, and that we humans are selfish in our disregard of Mother Earth. Now, whether you believe in God or not, or whether you believe in Pope Francis or not, he's, he's absolutely right. Today, there's really no organization or business in the United States and most of the rest of the world that expects to be taken seriously, that, that, that does not have that word sustainable found somewhere in their corporate responsibility statement. So because of that, I mean, now it's up to us to guide everyone through that open door, to make that final proper connection to, to food choice. The choices we make together, particularly with things we consume, such as food, dictates supply and therefore directs the use of our resources. It's not the industrial meat producer or the dairy factory farmer that will take down that last standing rainforest on earth. And it won't be the large commercial fishing trawler that's responsible for catching that that last poor single fish remaining in the sea. No, it'll be the human consumer who's demanding it. In summary of today in part one of these presentations, this is not a time for baby steps or for us to simply do less of something that's extremely destructive. It's also not the time to overfocus and blame all of our environmental woes on climate change. We need to begin thinking outside of self at our effect on others and on future generations of all species and therefore to act now, the clock is ticking. If you haven't done so already, please consider adopting an organically grown whole food plant-based side today and don't stop there. Encourage others to do the same. We must all remember that it is our planet earth that sustains and nourishes all of us. So it really won't matter how healthy we are if our planet isn't healthy. On this coming, Tuesday, I'm going to talk about so many more important topics critical to our survival as a species and the effect we have on our planet and other living beings. We're going to talk about our oceans, how damaged they are, the real truth about sustainable seafood. We're going to talk about current trends like grass-fed movement and regenerative agriculture. We're going to talk about that and we're going to look at current the current view of policymakers. I'm going to provide you with new and unique insights, some hurdles we have to overcome, even some predictions. And of course, we're going to take a look at timelines and solutions. And as always, I'm gonna offer a summary of optimism and of hope for the future. There's a lot to talk about. So I hope you'll uh, join me next Tuesday. We're in a unique situation to help save earth as we know it, save life on it now and allow a livable future for those who inherit this planet from us. Or we could allow it to continue on its current path to very likely have life as we know it be destroyed. We have enough information in front of us to make the right decisions. 
And in doing so, we'll be seen as not just stewards, but as superheroes who stopped a runaway train with all of us on board and turned it in the direction of optimal sustainability of rejuvenation before we went over that cliff. I consider those of you who've joined us today viewing online as our enlightened leaders. You can make this happen. You can inspire others to make it happen. I'd like to think it'll be our defining ethos, our legacy by which we will all be remembered. How nice would that be? So I encourage all of us here today or watching this presentation as a replay, I encourage all of us to go out and inspire others to become aware. Thank you so very much for sharing this past uh, hour and a half with me, a little more than an hour and a half. It's certainly a, a privilege for me to, to be here. Thank you so very much. Dr. Oppen Oppenlander, the privilege is truly ours. And I, I don't even know how to thank you personally enough. Um, and on behalf of The Real Truth About Health, um, what you've presented here today is horrifying is what it is. And it's something that um, I, I just know people are not seeing this in this way in the mainstream media or in many other places. So thank you for the work you're doing and for the stand you're being for the planet and all of us. Um, really you, heartfelt. No, and, thank you so much. Yeah, um, uh, we do have a few minutes for questions, if that's okay for you. Um, I yeah, want to make sure everybody great. knows before we jump into that, um, where can everybody get your books or if they want to reach out to you directly, where, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, great, great question, Ben. Um, so one of two ways, I mean, the first way is just they're, they're available on Amazon, uh, the books, and they can reach out to me personally at any point in time through one of two websites. One is I think you might have mentioned it at the at the onset. One is uh, comfortablyunaware.com, and the other one is our nonprofit uh, group to spread awareness, which is called InspireAwarenessNow.org. And so, yeah, thank you. We, you know, be more than happy to discuss any any issues with anybody at any point in time. Uh, very much appreciated. And um, and so with that, yeah, again, we, we have a few minutes for, for Q&A, and I, I already see some hands being raised. So I'm just going to explain to our audience for the first time, if, they, if they're here for the first time, how we go about it here at The Real Truth. Um, so give me just a moment on that. And that you is it. Thank you. Thank you. And so with that, folks, uh, in case you're not sure, we normally don't take questions directly from the chat box, but we ask everybody to raise their virtual hand. And in case you don't know how to do that, um, when you look at all the different tabs that you have with your Zoom window, uh, one of them says reactions. It's called your reactions tab. So you click on your reactions tab and different emojis will pop up. One of them says raised hand. You'll go ahead and click that function and we'll see your hand raised. And so we take as many of those raised hands as we possibly can in the allotted time that we have. And uh, with that, if you're ready, uh, doctor, we'll go ahead and take our first one. Sir, I'm, I'm always ready. <laughs> we, we really appreciate that. Thank you. And so our first question, and by the way, everybody, I'll call on you by your first name and I'll unmute you as we take you in. And so with that, uh, Dominique, welcome. Hi, Dr. Obenlander. This was a very, very, um, yeah, terrifying presentation. It's the first time I hear you, but I've been... Um, reading like Glenn Mercer and I know Sil I've been following Silas Rao for a, a long time. So I was familiar with those, um, those numbers and those numbers are really terrifying. And I feel that um, this is the terrifying nature that people just, just don't want to do anything about it because it's so like, it's, it, it's so difficult to acknowledge. It's like the, the movie don't look up, right? We're, we're kind of stuck in this. So um, I have a two part question. I have um, like how if you know, like of a, 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 an effective way to transmit the message to be heard without like discouraging everybody. And also how can transition take place with the small farmers? Because sometimes when we talk about climate change and, or, and agri, um, animal agriculture, the small farmers get, get offense with that and they, they, they feel like they're attacked. And, you know, us vegans are like, just, just don't want anybody to have fun in life and everything. So I was wondering if you have any, any tips on this and how us as, you know, individuals can actually do a change. And also, have you heard about the, have you signed the plant-based treaty? Thank you. 
Yeah, so you so first of all, Dominique, thank you so much for the questions. And um, there, I want to start by saying, first of all, that one of the primary messages that which will help answer those questions, one of the primary uh, thoughts or message within my presentation today, and as well as on Tuesday, is that first and foremost is that climate change is not is not the entire problem. And you know, no, knowing that, for, you know, you need to know that first. And um, this brings up, opens up the dialogue quite a bit better to, to say, for instance, small farmers and, and also, um, you know, so I think the first way to answer, answer that is go over the first question, which is the effective way to get the, the message out. And I think um, most, and, and I do want to point out also that a summary of all viable solutions across all, all possible means will be given in my at the end of my my second presentation on Tuesday. So I hope you tune in for that. Um, we go over exactly where dollars are going to be coming from in terms of solutions. And so, so first of all, about that first question, yeah, I think the most effective way is to um, continue joining uh, events like this. I think this is this is this is key because we can't just influence policymakers if they're not aware. So um, the first step is to become aware yourself, spread the word, encourage others to become aware. And again, I wouldn't focus only on climate change. I mean, we, I would focus on all these aspects of global depletion that we're talking about. Um, and, and, then, uh, and then do what you can with your, vo your vote, of course. And we all know our votes don't count in some cases because of you know, certain policy you know, makers are in positions that we feel they shouldn't be in for the environment. But that's the first step is, is to, to create effective an effective way to get the message out is through events like this, through through spreading the word with with books. To also um, the other way is to, uh, and I'll combine answers answering both that about the small family farmer is to um, there's there's quite a bit of dollars uh, being spent right now, 770 billion to be exact, and uh, worldwide global subsidies. And there's a way that we can redirect subsidies into uh, reforestation projects, saving mangroves, having small family farmers be incentivized for actually uh, 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 creating, planting, and using plant-based systems rather than animal-based systems. And if you educate them and you provide incentives, I, I you know, I, I I, I haven't talked to any smallholder farmer that wouldn't be willing to do that. You have they 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 take it takes a bit to go against cultural, um, you know, gr green that they you know that have been established in their culture and ideologies over the years. But you know, most of these small family farmers want to stay alive and they want to protect their their um, their children and their children's children. So it comes from education first, and then it comes from also redirecting uh, policymakers and and then where funds are going. And that can all be done. It, it can all be done. And then instead of terrifying, you use that word a couple of times. And I agree, it it should be terrifying because we're on timelines. But I, I think that you know to be terrified should be should coexist with knowing that there is still hope. You know, by doing the things that that we're suggesting. Thanks very much for that, Dr. Oppenlander. Uh, up next, we have David. David, welcome. Thank you. Um, am I the David you're speaking about? You yes, we've got you, David. Thank you. Okay, um, Dr. Oppenlander, great uh, lecture. A lot of numbers. I'm a numbers guy, so Good. it appeals to me. I think a lot of people aren't numbers people, and it can be mm -hmm. overwhelming. However, I'm wondering, um, I think there have been books written in the past about the real cost of, for instance, meat and animal products to society, the real financial cost. And I'm wondering, it seems to me, everything always comes down to money and there must be a way that people can uh, be educated enough and to, to, to recognize the real cost of these things to society, the financial cost. And is there any way that somehow that can be measured? And then if a government understands this, they can um, incentivize or tax to the point of um, influencing social behavior mm -hmm. to the real cost of these things. You yeah. know, if, 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 a, if a pound of beef, the cost to society is $50, that's going to discourage consumption. And it seems mm -hmm. to me that that may be our only answer at this point. Yeah. So, so David, first of all, uh, 
Terrific. Uh, first of all, thank you for for tuning in on all this, and thank you for the question. And so uh, that's at the heart, really, of 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 a number of solutions that we propose. And most of this, is, again, I'm going to be talking about on um, Tuesday. So that that's good. This is kind of a prelude to that. But let me let me start by saying that um, I do combine numbers. This numbers can be overwhelming, but you know I, when I'm when I'm presenting this, I I always try to point out the reality of just the generalization that this is happening. And then I place numbers to support that. So I, I think that I think the numbers are important. I mean, too. So so that aside, I appreciate your appreciation for numbers, but also just the stark reality of the generalization of these areas of global depletion that we're confronted with. Next is that, um, yes, uh, you know, I have a brother that brings us up frequently that, you know, states that, you know, unless we're hit with money or something right in front of us, you know, your child is being run over by a car, you're not going to necessarily uh, uh, get called to action. But um, there are, there are uh, studies and statistics that can place a value uh, somewhat within a generalized amount to our health. It's very difficult to place it on our environment because you got to have these ancient aquifers that are irreplaceable. There's no, there's no money that can replace the water from the old Alala, for instance. So, but you can certainly generalize and, and come up with some taxation of some sort because you're exactly right. Um, we're, we need to educate first, but unless, unless the general public is being, uh, you know, something hits their, their wallet, it seems like, which is unfortunate, um, they're not going to act. So, right, yeah, sure, it comes down to money and there is a way to correlate this by just uh, incentivizing farmers, small farmers to, um, at, or even larger farmers, to produce only uh, uh, plant-based foods, but then also the consumers. Yeah, there's gotta be some way and there is a way we can we can do that. It just has to be, we can't do it ourselves. You know, it has to be, it has to be funneled through policymakers too. So it seems difficult, but you hit on exactly what I think it's gonna take. You, you, we, we have, we're on timelines where it's gonna take incentivizing at the same time taxation. And I talk much more about this on Tuesday because I believe you can do both. Excellent. Okay. Thanks very much, doctor. Um, Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, it looks like we've got time for another question. Let's go to Joel. Joel, yeah. welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Oppenlander. Absolutely remarkable presentation. I, I wish that Thank everyone you. on the planet could hear it. Uh, and speaking of that, uh, Ben, at some point, it would be great if you could let us know, because the question has been raised, when could this presentation be made available to us? I'd love to take this <clears throat> to my community and my state legislature and others. Uh, Dr. Oppenlander, my question is this, uh, and I, I have this thrown back at me frequently. Let's say that we could be very, very successful and we had this massive change in dietary patterns all around the world, and it literally collapsed. Let's not talk about the mechanism of taxation and stuff, but let's say it literally collapsed animal agriculture. The business ends. Uh, and obviously, that's not going to happen in one day. It's going to be over some period. Mm -hmm. of what does what is the most humane program you can recommend for what happens to the animals currently in the pipeline? In other words, we can stop breeding programs mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so that we don't produce more. But what right. happens to animals currently existing? What's the best we yeah. can do? On behalf? Well, Joel, a couple quick things. First of all, um, thank you so much for the kind words and thank you for the questions. Um, uh, ben, I'd like to answer, this is very important. I think that first part of, it actually was more of a statement, um, well, and a question to you, Ben, but I think the first part of that is very important. You know, I spoke a few years ago to the European Parliament and I've, I've spoken to a number of policymakers, but that was probably the most in collective in, in, in one, you know, meeting and nothing really came out of it. Um, and it's really discouraging for me, but I think that's the key is to take a presentation like this, which sums things up greatly, not just about climate change, but you need a comprehensive view uh, for every policymaker everywhere in the world, and let them let them understand the. That's that's I think the education for them is first, and then and then having understanding really a basis for which they can then make some policies um, uh, changes. So that that's a very good point. I think that certainly a, dis a distillation of this, you know, of this and my presentation on Tuesday is the start, not just not just thinking the policymakers are going to get around to it, but actually taking it to them and making sure they watch this. Um, and then secondly, yeah, that question about what do we do with the, 
you know, what do we do with the current animals? That, that seems to pop up almost at all my, when I was lecturing, you know, extensively, you know, over the last decade, that comes up frequently. So my thought is this, you know, with the reforestation and the rewilding and all the solutions that, that I'm going to be talking about on Tuesday as well, um, um, you know, I'm calling for I I immediate elimination. We don't, we don't really have time to phase it in, as I mentioned, and I pretty much uh, dwelled on that eat less meat issue. Um, so, but it would still take about five, realistically, five to 10 years for any type of rewilding to take place correctly um, or reforesting or, you know, re reestablishing mangroves, um, even some policies for incentivizing taxation. I feel like it would still take about five to 10 years. And, you know, most of these animals, uh, I don't, I am not advocating at all, you know, by any means, you know, slaughtering any of them. So most of them would be phased out and they're not all born today. They're not all. And most of these, unfortunately, most of these, you know, domesticated uh, animals, the ones that have been bred for domestication uh, or animal husbandry, they typically have a, and I don't know if you, how much experience you've, you've had, Joel, with these, but they, most of them have between, you know, turkeys may, you know, they, they typically have a heart attack if you go out and try to, you know, uh, pet them on the head, you know, they're so they're bred. So they're, and, and, and they don't live that long. So they're typically we've seen on our rescue and sanctuary that most of these animals that are bred for, for slaughtering, you know, live between two, two years to 12 years. I mean, on their own, on the 10 to 12 years. And so that core, that actually, you know, sort of uh, coincidentally, uh, you know, sort of coincides, you know, fair, favorably with a five to 10 year projection of when all these forests could be rewilded and, and, and you know, rejuvenated. And um, so I think it's a five to 10 year project, but we need to find some way to stop, you know, with, with incentivizing and taxation, stop all of, you know, eliminate meat and dairy and the production of that today. So, but then it would take about five to 10 years and uh, they would gradually be, you know, uh, uh, sort of passing on their own. So does that help, Joel? I hope um, it, it it certainly does, Doctor Applemander. Okay. And I I, um, I guess I just want to say at this point, it's it is actually time for us to move on to our next lecture. And before yeah. we do, uh, just a couple of quick things. Number one, folks, and and I may not have the exact details right now, but I will tell you this: every day here at the Real Truth About Health, for instance, today and all of the lectures from today will be available to all of you tomorrow. I believe it's on our website and or our YouTube channel, but go ahead and take a look. I, I will ask our tech team to go ahead and post something in the chat sometime soon when they get a chance. Um, but it's free and, you know, free for everyone and you can share it with everyone. And uh, and then in the coming months, we'll also go ahead and uh, and edit down some of the videos and make sure that they're uh, in bite size portions so that it's even easier for folks to watch. And so um, but, yeah, this is all available to you for free. Um, as well as the membership club that we have as well. And so with that, um, Dr. Oppenlander, I, uh, again, on behalf of all of us, I don't know how to say thank you enough for your work and please pass that along to your wife, Jill, as well, for everything that she's <laughs> doing. And um, really just, just amazing. And, uh, and we are so thrilled that you're back. It's been a few <laughs> years, so we're, we're so glad you're back with us. We're so glad you're coming back on Tuesday. Everybody do not miss it. Dr. Oppenlander will be here back with us on Tuesday. Um, in the meantime, I know I'm not the only person that wants to thank you. And so I'm going to have our tech team unmute our entire audience. Everybody, what do you want to say to Dr. Richard Oppelander? Yeah. Thank you.